Okay, awesome. So uh, this is a quickish presentation. My apologies. My apologies for there being lots of words on it. Uh, I did put a diagram. I feel bad that they're not two diagrams, but hopefully uh, this conveys the important details and gets everyone kind of on the same page. Um, so this is a quickish overview, um, but it has a lot of detail. So I guess the first slide, whenever you talk to RBAC, you kind of have to build explain what it is. Uh, in essence, it's you're taking activities of humans, mapping them into roles uh, that relate to their job responsibilities. And then in order to grant access to these, uh, these tasks or items or things they need to do, you group these humans back into the roles. So in essence, these tasks might be like administering machines, uh, troubleshooting machines or generating reports from, say, Ironic. So I think it's kind of important to note that we did have early support in Ironic from the beginning. We had something called bare metal admin, and we also had bare metal observer, which kind of served the same purpose, except these were based on the use of a bare metal project. And the default rule rule structure in the policies, which by default, ironic honors a legacy admin project in OpenStack, which is kind of bad. It's hard to write rules for. Uh, most people just write is admin. Uh, if the rules match properly or not, it's bad, <laughs> depending on how you approach the problem. And the conundrum of is admin specifically is uh, if you have an admin of any tenant, they match as admin. So you have to be very particular about your rules and how you approach them. And yes, that was the corgi. I'm gonna call. <laughs> so anyway, you can kind of get where, why the legacy uh, support was kind of a bad way of approaching things, or at least in OpenStack in general. But really for us, it hasn't mattered that much. We've encouraged people to use a, a Barrel project. Ironic has taken an admin only approach, except we've kind of been drifting away from admin only. We've been drifting more towards providing the ability for more settings to be enabled, more user flexibility. And when you kind of look at the entire picture, it's good to you, you start understanding why it was necessary for the community to kind of go, oh, we should probably retool a lot of this, which is the secure our back solution. And as I just mentioned, this was a larger community effort. Um, I believe something like 13 projects ended up merging code to support a secure outbreak model. And this comes from the solution Keystone came up that solved this problem, which is where you end up with a scope uh, and you scope these activities. And three scopes exist in this model, a system scope, a domain scope, and a project scope. Project scope is basically what we've always had in OpenStack. System scope is relatively new. It's intended for the system itself or those administering the system. In other words, it's like your global admin or your legacy admin tenant. Um, you have elevated rights in theory <laughs> and you should be able to see or do anything or view everything and do reporting or whatever is necessary. And so, the wall be released of Ironic has support for system and project scopes. Um, this has been a lot of work. I want to thank everyone who has reviewed the code. Um, it's been a huge effort. But in order to kind of talk about our support, it's also necessary to kind of talk about our roles. And the Keystone model of roles is a little different uh, than what we had where we had bare metal admin, bare metal observer, and you had to explicitly grant access. The secure RBAC model, you have an admin member and a reader. And if you think about it, it's kind of like your creator, deleter are the admin. They can create items, they can delete items, uh, globally at least. Members have certain other abilities to change, update, but they also have other rights enable as they're able to read. Everyone can read because admin cascades to member, member cascades to reader. So this discussion always tends to get into what if I want to see the secrets? 
and there has been discussion of an auditor uh, role. Um, <laughs> there's not consensus behind the auditor role. If the community comes with comes to consensus, I'll gladly implement the auditor role in Ironic. Um, and it's still possible to do with legacy policy roles. It's just it's until there is consensus on how it's approached, then it kind of is a mistake for us to implement it. So ultimately the kind of the practical result of our back in Ironic, what was bare metal admin becomes system scoped admin. What was bare metal observer becomes system scoped reader. We now have a shiny brand new member role, which allows um, operators to be able to basically do maintenance tasks. Uh, you don't want someone to necessarily be able to clean the machine, but you know, like second level support to be able to do break fix or possible redeployment, that's what the member role is specifically for. But it's also kind of important to note that we are in a migration period as a result of all this work. Operators ultimately do need to move away from bare metal admin and bare metal observer. The policy evaluation for <laughs> all of this policy logic gets applied to both the deprecated roles and the new roles. And in this case, luckily, custom policy still wins. So if you have a custom policy, it overrides it. Um, at this time, warning messages and logs are extremely problematic. I've got a commitment from the Oslo policy to get a fix in for that uh, because right now it's very noisy. Um, extremely noisy. It's not operator friendly, unfortunately. That should be fixed soon. Oh, also, uh, there are Oslo policy settings to skip legacy and enforce scope validation of the users. Uh, basically, setting these two settings forces everything over into the new logic. It disables the legacy uh, deprecated rule logic, which allows for much more secure installation <laughs> and use of Ironic. So, yeah, but there's always more. Um, Ironic did, went, started heading in a little bit of a different direction than the rest of the community with owners and lessees. And the whole idea is bare metal is a physical asset, I want to be able to, I, you have to be able to have some sort of ownership of it and you have to be able to somehow go, I, I want to provide it or lend it over to this, these people over here. Um, so the net effect of all of this work is that some API endpoints are strictly enforced to system only. Some can be used by policy or by projects or project scoped users, policy permitting. The default policy does allow random cat. <laughs> the default policy does allow for um, some end endpoints to be usable, some endpoints are not usable, like things that would be purely admin only, like conductor listings uh, or chassis. Those are all admin only, only system scoped. You basically need to be an admin to do anything on them. Again, as I said before, the custom policy still wins. It overrides the policy and code logic. And ultimately, project scope user can perform some a subset of the activities in the API. So it's important to kind of talk about how the logic gets validated. The policy flow is essentially, is the request system scope? If yes, the access is validated based upon role. There's no additional database lookups. It's clean, it's efficient, it's easy. If it's not system scoped, the project ID is matched. It basically goes to a is less say or owner matched, which means additional database lookups in certain cases uh, or database joins. And if that doesn't match, then the logic falls back all the way to the deprecated role until they're disabled. If they do match, then the user is able to access the resources based upon the node relationship uh, with the granted rights of either owner or lessee. And they're not the same. Um, I can't think of a good example off the top of my head, but essentially lessee has is far more restricted in what they can do. 
they don't they can't um, they can't they're not the administrator of the machine they're a user whereas the owner is intended to be a more of an, an administrative level of access to the machine namely because in this model they own the machine they probably control the machine it's in their racks their cables everything so that's kind of the model that this is built around and access is then granted based upon that so I kind of noted some possible some downsides. The additional database access is based upon the ability, the need to understand if there's an LSA or an owner associated with something. Uh, we've done most of this with joins, which is about as efficient as we can make until we have those columns indexed. Um, we'll be doing some database optimization work in this upcoming cycle to improve this act these. Uh, Davis interactions to make it more efficient and faster. And um, I highly encourage larger operators not to immediately upgrade, um, mainly because we don't have a solid understanding of exactly how some of these joins are, are going to interact until we have these um, query, these uh, indexes in place. Um, one other thing to note is allocations are available to everyone. Anyone that's a user of a system can create, request an allocation, but their project ID still has to match. It still goes in the database join. If they don't match, they're not able to get, they're not able to match a machine that, or machine doesn't exist that's assigned to their project, then it's basically useless uh, and the allocation will fail. So basically the same basic rules apply, the machine has to exist. So important thing is where can you learn more we've got a documentation or documentation that's been posted it includes links to the specification uh, it also includes links to supporting keystone documentation try and provide more clarity and you know i'm here to answer questions if there are any so are there any questions thank you very much julia are there any questions for Julia? Before Hopefully I start, people, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully people aren't like going, oh no, <laughs> uh, and running away, but it's, it's a really positive change. Um, I'm really happy that we got it through and we're able to do it. And it really opens the horizon for, ooh, there's a project name horizon. It it will further enable us as we go down the path of additional integrations and additional logic. Right. And while this is all built around Keystone, I could see someone building a plugin to basically go, here are the associations and here's membership and go from there. But that's not something we have today. It could. Someone wants to put the work in. Right. Okay, I, I start with questions then if no one else wants. So, so you, you already preempted one of my questions. You know, I'm, I'm very like worried about scale and what happens if you have like hundreds or even thousands of, of nodes as we have. Um, so, so when you say like you, you, uh, you recommend to wait with the upgrade, you're talking about the upgrade to Wallaby, right? Okay, so if, if there's like optimizations that's being backported, you expect these, these optimizations to be like in the I, code only and not, on, not affecting the database in any way? So I expect them to be database impacting uh, in terms of adding columns. I don't expect them to be required. Um, so I expect what we'll do is we'll look at the look at various aspects, and we'll probably go ahead and merge schema changes on backports that are optional that are just add column indexes basically. Okay. That's that's how I'm foreseeing it. That way the database will still work. Uh, the operator can make the decision of when they want to build that index. Luckily, there's not that much data to index, uh, but it would still it'll still help once those columns are there and Davis should be more responsive. Right. For a larger operator like yourself, you'll want to probably go ahead and set Nova to run system scope out of the gate. Um, that's probably the biggest change. And, and if you do that, you won't see any of the performance impacts. Right. But if you have any other project scope users are trying to use the API, whether legitimately or not legitimately, that's going to start incurring additional database lookups and logic. 
Right. Uh, so it's really important to try and move to system scope because that we only fall back to um, trying to retrieve that if it's not if it's not system scoped. Right. What What about Keystone? What about the additional impact on Keystone? So that's a it's an, it's interesting to bring that up because the way that it works is when you authenticate uh, to Keystone. It tells your browser, here are your roles, here's your data. Except that's not what is actually used to populate the data that gets passed into the context in the API. Uh, essentially, <laughs> your request goes to Ironic. Ironic then go issues a request to uh, Keystone Middleware. Right. Keystone Middleware um, validates against Keystone itself independently to populate what the roles and memberships and scope is uh, so as in, like an override. So basically, um, in some cases, yes, you can say, here are my, here are, here's my level of access, but that's only if Keystone Middleware is not running. Mm -hmm. Keystone Middleware will reset those values from what's in Keystone, and that is, that's a memcached lookup or an API lookup and then memcached access. Right. But the, the load on Keystone will nonetheless increase, right? There will no, be it, it should be the same. OK. Because uh, every request that gets issued will either will hit Keystone Middleware. It was hitting Keystone Middleware. OK, yes. okay. fair enough. It'll, so yeah, same exact path. It just we have some additional logic in Ironic now to support those cases. OK. I have more questions. So no one else. <laughs> okay, so, so as an operator, um, you know, you said like operators should new, move to the new or migrate to the new model, right? They should deprecate their old uh, bare metal observer, bare metal admin. If they don't, what is going to happen? Because I guess that like most most operators won't follow, sorry most operators won't follow it that closely, and they would just like upgrade and then what is going to happen if, if, if operators are not aware and just continue to upgrade? I mean like not, not necessarily the large operators that will see like database degradation, um, but uh, also smaller operators. Will, will the access change somehow or will that break or? You're muted, Julia. Yeah, uh, so the queries should still end up being joined at that point. Uh, if they're not using the fields then I suspect the query should return about the same amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, but naturally, we'll want, eventually want indexes on those queries, especially in the much larger deployments that are out there. Now, I was just wondering if operators will learn it the hard way the moment they upgrade that. I mean, they, they should test, of course, and see this in their QA environment. I was just wondering if then at some point it just stops and say, like, okay, look, your, your request cannot be satisfied because uh, you're using some, something that has been deprecated, doesn't work anymore. So you're not off. So we, we're not. We didn't remove the legacy rule, legacy policy and code uh, rules. Uh, we'll probably remove them. Well, it might be this cycle. It might be next. Um, there's a push within the community to go ahead and get the legacy rule structure ripped out completely, uh, of, uh, out of Oslo policy. So mm -hmm. it would behoove operators to go ahead and make those transitions and upgrades. But if they're also using custom policy file, they could they don't have to change the way they're doing things today. It just will end up having some join queries on the database. Right. The 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 auditor discussion that you mentioned, that's that's a like community wide discussion. There it it so we had an ironic it came back up in the larger Keystone, the larger community, I guess, about four months ago. Mm -hmm. um, basically, there's there's disagree there's disagreements over the level of access that should be had by uh, an auditor. Um, my view is basically it's it should just be a read only user that has the ability or has um, the appropriate settings set so that secrets aren't masked. Although there's also other people that say it should just be a read-only user, <laughs> and there should not be there should not be the unmasking of secrets. Mm -hmm. I can see it from both points of view. Uh, the the real conundrum is 
what people want audit, audit for is actually like security compliance reporting and auditing, not necessarily accounting. Right. Yeah, that's different. So, so there's like like requests from the community for this auditor role. There's there are requests in the community. There is some discussion that happens every few months. Um, I know there's been discussion in Keystone centric uh, Keystone type community for some time, mm -hmm. but largely it's it's kind of the same conundrum that we have. It's like how do how are people really using this? And they could still define it with the custom with a custom policy file today if they wanted to. Okay. Thanks. Um, Thank you, everyone.